talents in the Bible, and he left, he asked them to invest those talents uh, until he returned. Yes, and when the master returned, one of the men that he gave a talent to buried the talent in the ground and didn't do anything with the talent. And the Bible says that the master was angry and said, why didn't you invest the talent that I gave you? and took the talent from him and gave it to someone else. Mm. So all of us, you know, Jesus is a businessman, and, and all of us have been given talents, uh, whether it's a gift, whether it's a natural talent or spiritual gift, our time, uh, our energy, our money, all of us have been given a talent by God, and sooner or later, at the end of time, God is going to come and look for interest off of what he's invested in us. All right. All right. He, he's a businessman. Right. So, so if God has given you the, the talent or the ability to sing, and when God comes back, what he expects is that you fed that gift into flame, and that gift or that talent is more than what God originally gave to you. Right. Did you work the gift? Did you train? Did, did, did you use it to bless other people? Well, whatever God has given you, when he comes back, in so many words, God said, don't give me what I gave you. I want interest on what I invested. Yes, don't, don't offer me back the same thing that I blessed you with. I'm a businessman. Give, give me some interest. I'm looking for interest on what I invested in you, woman of God. I'm looking for interest in what I invested in you, man of God. And if it's, if it's nothing else, God has given all of us life. And God's going to return, and he's going to find out or, or inquire of us, how did you invest your life? He's a businessman, and he's looking for interest off of what he's invested in each of us in the house. Amen? Amen. Look at Mark, New Testament, chapter 10, as we work through this thought, receiving interest on your investment. Mark, New Testament, chapter 10. I'm just going to read a couple of verses as we work through this thought. I think about um, some of the sacrifices uh, that we make or some of the investments that we make. Uh, and and I, I had the thought that death sustains life. And I thought about the seed. You know, when the seed is planted, 
uh, the seed, after a certain period of time, if it's planted in good soil, and that's key, if it's planted in good soil, after a certain time it germinates. Yes. And, and it, it no longer becomes a seed, but it ceases to become a seed in order to give life to the plant. Death sustains life. Um, as parents, we make sacrifices and investments in our children, uh, and, and we die to some of the things that we want. We die to some of our dreams in order that our children, you know, we look and hope to get a good investment out of what we invested in our children. Some of us do it in relationships, and, and remember now, when you make these investments, when, when you sow, you have to sow on good soil. Some of us, we sow on some, some bad, raunchy soil in these relationships, and we didn't get anything back, but, but the key is sowing on good ground and getting a good return on what we invest. But in marriages, we invest in our spouses, hoping to get a good return on our investments. Uh, God has blessed us with husbands and wives, and God has also said, don't, don't offer back to me the same thing I blessed you with. Is your wife better since I gave her to you? Amen. Is your husband a better man since I gave him to you? Amen. I want some interest on what I invested, God says. So let's look at, are we in, in, in Mark chapter 30, chapter uh, 10, I'm sorry. Look at verse 28, and this is uh, during Christ's earthly ministry, and um, he's with the disciples, and in verse 28 says, Then Peter said unto him, Lord, we, we left all to follow you. Yeah. Verse 29, And Jesus answered Peter and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, there is not a man that has left his house, brother and sisters, father, mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, in this life, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and, and in the world to come, eternal life. So, so from what I see, God has blessed us with life, and the best investment that we can, can, can do or invest in, in, with our lives is kingdom. Yes, sir. The kingdom, because Jesus said if you leave anything, if you invest anything, if you die to anything for the sake of the kingdom of God, you're going to receive some interest. Whether it be houses or land, you're going to receive more houses. Whether it's money, you'll receive more money. Whether you have to sacrifice your children for the sake of the kingdom, God says, I'm going, to, I'm going to bless you with more children. They may not even be your biological children. I'm going to bless you with more friends. Whatever you sacrifice, Jesus says, multiply it by a hundred times, and you will receive it in this life, and in the life to come, eternal life. And you, you are going to have problems. There will be persecutions, Jesus says, but make this investment in the kingdom of God. And what is the kingdom of God? Everything that God owns, wherever God is gaining territory, everywhere where God has authority. And we know that, that, that God owns everything. And, and for a season, God has allowed Satan to rule down here on earth, but his time will be up soon. And God, he reigns in the heavens and he reigns on earth. And, and we are to be his agents to expand the kingdom of Almighty God. Turn me down a little bit, uh, Sister Cuz. Uh, we are God's agents, and everything that we vest as Christians in the kingdom, we will, we will receive a return. And Jesus said, y'all do the math now. Whatever you invest for the sake of the kingdom, you receive a hundred times what you've invested. All right? Now... Why aren't we seeing some of our investments, Christians? Those who have truly invested into the kingdom of God. Those who have truly laid down their lives. And, and the Bible says, and Jesus says in another place, uh, Jesus says in, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 24, we're not turning to it, but he says, if you hold on to your life, that that I have given you, if you hold on to your life, you're going to lose it, Jesus says. But if you give your life for the sake of the kingdom, he says, you receive life. 
So if, if we give our lives up for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of God and the kingdom, we will gain life. Uh, but if we hold on to what we have, we'll lose it, Jesus says. So why aren't we, those who have laid their lives down for the sake of the kingdom, why aren't we seeing uh, interest on our investments? And it could be, and, and I've, I've talked about this before, it could be that, that, that we are not causing our seed of investment to germinate. We, 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 you know, we're not, we're not watering our seed. Uh, we're not allowing the sun and oxygen on our seed because the Bible says our words are like seeds and, 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 and what we speak, we, we will reap uh, what we say according to Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 20 and 21. Our words are like seeds and many of us, good Christians, mean well, but many of us, we speak negativity on our lives and on our investments. On our lives and on our investment. Do I need to switch mics? Got one. What mic? <coughs> Three. All right. Um, I'll, I'll switch. Is it working? Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So, so we hinder our harvest with our words. I've been working for this church for 50 years, and I just, you know, ain't nobody doing it right. I don't see any productivity, and I don't, I don't see the, the sense in it, but I'm just here. I've been here this long. I might as well not leave. And we don't look for a harvest, and the Bible says our words kill our investment or our harvest. So, so we speak to our seed. We speak positive on what we're investing in the kingdom, and Jesus says we're, so we will receive a hundredfold in this life in what we invested. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 12, New Testament. I'm just going to read one verse. And we're looking at how to receive interest on what we invest. And also, we need to be careful with sowing on good ground. This is the account of uh, the Hebrew writers writing about Jesus' investment. And what Christ went through for us, look at verse 2, and the Hebrew writer says, Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your hearts or faint in your minds. Now, Jesus is an example for us Christians. The Bible says that he was God and he was with God. He thought in that robbery to be equal with God. And I don't, I don't know why he did it other than love, but the Bible says that he came down from heaven and became a man, put on uh, the form, took on the form of a man, lived a holy lifestyle, he allowed himself to feel all the pains that we feel while we're down here, lived a holy life. He allowed sinful man to beat him and to crucify him. And the Bible says that he gave his life. He sacrificed his life. And on the third day, he resurrected. But here's what Christ did because he understood that, that the, the law of the harvest, he, he, he invested, although the cross was a death for those who were cursed, Jesus being holy and Jesus being God, I think I need to switch. Six one on. What number? Number one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So Jesus being God, being equal with God. He became a man and sacrificed his life. Uh, but Jesus realized in the law of the harvest, he's going to receive some interest. And the interest that he was looking for was your life and my life being productive. He, he was looking to see the travail of his soul. He was looking to see interest out of our lives. He died for us. He sacrificed for us. And, and for, for a time that we are down here, Christ is looking to see 
the benefit of his death. That's why he, he sacrificed a shameful death. Gee, the Bible says that despising the shame, even though he didn't like the shame of the cross, being a high and holy God, he sacrificed his life and died that shameful death, and, and, and he became cursed, the Bible says, that we might become the righteousness of God, and all of us that he died for, he's looking for interest on his investment. But, but what caused him to do it? The Bible says he saw the joy set before him. It, it was for, he, he knew that he was going to get a return on his investment, and he is our example. Anything that we lay down for the sake of the kingdom, by faith, look for a return on what you invest. If you lay down your life for the sake of the kingdom, look for a return on your investment. So the Bible says that when Jesus died, now he's seated at the right hand of God, and he has received the name which is above every name. Jesus sits in the highest authority. He died the most, the most embarrassing and shameful death on the cross. And the Bible says that after he, he, afterwards, he was exalted to the highest place and the highest authority had the highest name given among men. So he saw that he was going to receive interest on his investment if he laid his life down. Y'all with me? Amen. It's hot up here. I'm working. All right. Look at, look at, and we're, we're, we're about done. Look at uh, Romans chapter 16. As we work through, through the thought, receiving interest on your investment. Romans chapter uh, 16. We're almost done. And we want to make sure that we don't hinder our interest. All right? And let's look at verse 17. Just going to read a couple of verses. gives us some instruction. Okay. I got a new Bible today too, y'all. I got, I got a different word. Uh, so I'm, uh, I don't have my old school Bible. I'm, I'm like I'm lost up here. All right. So look at verse, let's look at verse uh, 17 and verse 18. So how do we protect our investment? Let's look at, uh, okay, for the Apostle Paul says, I beg you, brother, in verse 17, them which cause division and offenses Contrary to the doctrine or the teaching which you have learned, the Bible says, Paul says, avoid them. For they that are such serve the Lord, serve not rather the Lord Jesus Christ, but they serve their own bellies, and by good words and fair speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple or the innocent. So Paul says, beware of those, it looks like they're sowing on good ground, but they're messing up their investments because their motives are all messed up and they're serving to feed their own bellies. Now, I told y'all, y'all gonna get an interest on whatever you sow, uh, but that cannot be our highest motive for what we do. And we're gonna look at this as we close. So, so Paul says, first of all, Paul says, now, if you see anybody in the church that's causing havoc and division, he says, avoid them. Love them from a distance, Paul says. Uh, we are called to make investments for the Lord. But he said, if you see anybody that, that, that's, you know, they're, they're causing havoc, and, and, and they might be serving the Lord. They probably own five different boards in the church. 
but they're causing so much division in the church, you know, and, and, and disunity in the church, Paul says, avoid them. Love them from a distance. And I thought about this. I thought about this. Uh, my brother and I uh, used to live in Detroit back in the day. And we were at a friend's house. And they had an a English master, big dog. And we were in the gate outside. We were in the gate. Dog, you remember this? We were in the gate. And the dog got loose. So, so I started running. You know, I hit. I started running. I got to the gate. And, and, and I looked back to see if, if, if Darwin was coming, and Darwin was doing the cool man's job. <laughs> so I said, hold on, hold on. So I closed the gate, because I didn't want the dog to get out, and he was mad, because I closed him in with the dog. But my thing is, ain't no sense in both of us. Both of us get, you know, getting ate up. So I closed the gate, and thank God, you know, they, they got the dog before he got to my brother. And, and, and nobody got hurt, and he was angry, but 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 he didn't get to the gate fast enough. So so I thought about that when, when Paul says, when you see those troublemakers coming in the church, you can love them from a distance. But I, I said, you know what we can do when we see troublemakers in the house of God, and they're probably going to come. We 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 can do the cool man job. You see them coming, you just do the cool man job to get away from. Them. I know you ain't supposed to run run in church, but we can jog away from them and love them from a distance and pray for them. That's what the book says now. And, and, and I believe that if they're truly saved, they will come around. Yes. They'll get tired of people avoiding them. They'll get tired of people ignoring their gossip and talking about people. Now, if you listen to it, you're feeding it. But they will get tired of people avoiding them and eventually, uh, hopefully, that they would repent if they're truly children of God. Y'all got me? Yeah. But, but that's how we can spoil our interest or in what we invest in the kingdom of God by doing it with wrong motives. Doing it so we can be seen. Doing it just to feed our own bellies. Mm -hmm. So folk can think that we're religious and that we got it together. Y'all got me? Mm -hmm. Last five, flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read one verse. One verse. We must protect our investment. If we're going to receive interest off of what we sow into the kingdom of God, we must protect our investment. Watch what you say. Watch negative talk. Change your language. I don't care how bad things look. I don't, I don't care what the statistics say. I don't care. We believe the promises in the word of God. Amen. So we speak the promises and we speak the word of God over our investments and everything has to submit to the word of God. So, so we sow, our, our tongues are like seeds, and we sow uh, with positive words. Are we in verse chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13? All right, let's look at verse 3. And the Apostle Paul says, now he's, he's, he's uh, talking about the right motive for using our spiritual gifts or for serving in the church or in the body of Christ. And he says, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Paul says, even if I give all my goods to feed the poor. And, and y'all understand the law of the harvest, right? Like, if you just got a little bit of money and you're struggling, you have to decide whether that $5 is a harvest or a seed. Now, you know that $5 ain't going to pay no bill. It ain't going to pay the light bill. It's not going to pay your rent. Uh, but you have to decide, is this a harvest or a seed? And sometimes, and I've been there, I have, I've sold money that I thought I needed, but I sold it because I believed to get a harvest off of what I sold. I realized, you know what, this $12 is a seed because it can't get my car repaired, it can't pay any bills, so I sold it into the kingdom of God, and God gave me interest on what I sold. But Paul says in verse 3, he says, though I give everything, Give all, all that I have to the poor and, and, and think about it. Now, supposedly, if you give all your goods to the poor, if you give everything you have to the poor, according to we, what we looked at earlier, when Jesus says you'll get a hundredfold of what you sow into the kingdom, if you give everything to the poor, you ought to be looking for a long, a large rather, investment. If you multiply everything you own and you lay it down for the poor and you multiply that by a hundredfold like Jesus says, 
you ought to be looking for a rich return on your investment. But Paul says, this, this is how you mess everything up, Christians. He says, I, I give, though I give everything to the poor that I own, and though I give my body to be burned, if I have not charity, if I have not love, if I don't do it out of, out of the motivation of love, if I don't do it because I love that person, he says it's all for nothing or it will profit you nothing or you will ruin the interest on what you invest. If, if we don't do it out of the motivation of love or charity. Or if we serve the Lord just to fill our own bellies for selfish reasons so folk can see me doing it. You, you mess up your interest, you mess up what you invest in the kingdom of God. So we serve one another out of a heart of love and not, and I'm closing, but not our, our fake, fickle, rather, emotional, sometimes up, sometimes down love. But we serve one another with God's love, the agape love, no matter how, how they acted that, that particular Sunday. We still love them, we still serve them. Even if we think they don't deserve it, none of us deserve it. We still serve them. We, st we still love them. We still, even if it seems like folks don't appreciate what you've been investing, we continue to work because we realize that we're working for God. We're working in the kingdom, and he will give the investment, not them. So we keep serving them because we love them and because we love God. And we will receive an interest on our investment. And those that we see that, that you know, and you know them, if, if, if you see them, I mean, we've been in the church circle long enough, the folk that really don't love people, but they just want folk to see them doing things, and, 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 and they're spreading gossip, and, you know, do the old, do the cool man jog. Yeah, do like Darwin, just do the cool man jog, and, and pray for them while you're jogging. Amen. Lord, I just ask that you would just pray for them, and, and you just meet their needs, Lord, they're feeling insecure, and they... You know, and they've been abused when they were younger, and, and they're looking to be fulfilled and, and to fill their bellies the wrong way, Lord. Just pray for them, Lord, and give them strength and help them to repent. Just, just pray for, for them, rather, from a distance, but don't entertain their foolishness, the Bible says. Interest on our investments. Not only will we receive interest, but God is looking for interest on what he has invested in us as people of God. What gifts have God given us? How much time has God given us? What talent has God given us? Are we invested in the right soil? Or are we investing everything that God has given us into the wrong kingdom? There's the kingdom of God and then there's the kingdom of Satan. Jesus told on the devil, he said that, that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. He's a thief. And his mission is to kill, steal, and to destroy your life. Why would you invest your time, your energy, your gifts, the talents that God has given you, have, has given you for a kingdom that don't love you back? But in the kingdom of God, whatever we sacrifice, we receive a return if we do it out of a motivation of love. Father, thank you for who you are and for the fact that you are the God of all flesh, Lord, and there's absolutely nothing too hard for you. We thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, that you will help us to give out of a pure heart, out of pure motives, Lord, and help us to realize, Lord, even though this ministry has been left for dead, that everything we invest with a pure heart you will give us a return, Lord. And the church is going to grow. The finances will grow. Uh, the people will come, Lord, because we're making good investments, and there is no crop failure with God if we sow with good and pure motives. Thank you for what we have coming, Lord. Thank you for the seeds that we've sown down through the years, Lord. As my brother and I talked about seeds that we've sown in other ministries, and we don't believe that we got the full return or the full interest on what we've sown. Some, some people here have sold into people and they didn't get a good interest on a return, Lord. We ask that you would give full interest on what we've sown into our children, into our relationships, into our marriages, and that we be careful to sow 
on good soil, on good soil, whatever we do for Christ will last. In Jesus' name we praise you and thank you. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for his word. Yes, Will follow me all my days. Your goodness and mercy. Can you imagine? My guests saw Jesus pull 1,000 demons out of a single woman. Want to hear the most amazing thing that happened next? Is there a supernatural dimension? A world beyond the one we know? Can we tap into ancient secrets of the supernatural? Can our dreams contain messages from heaven? Is God ready to bring a tsunami wave of healing onto planet Earth today? Sid Roth has spent over 40 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid for this edition of It's Supernatural. Hello, I'm Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. My guest, Dr. Francis Miles, is in South Africa in a tent meeting, and they bring a woman that has been insane for 20 years. What happened? They bring her into the crusade, and uh, she, has no, she has no essence of being there. The men that were holding her had to hold her all the time because she was trying to run out. And then when the, when, I, when the Lord uh, brought me closer to pray for her, I saw, uh, the, I saw a spirit get opened, a body got opened up, and I saw a spirit, and a spirit was surrounded with that, what looked like a beehive of thousands of, of, of demons with twinky eyes. And, and then a spirit spoke to me in English. English. She, she didn't speak English. She didn't speak English. Uh, it was, she what, spoke Zulu. 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 <laughs> And she, she speaks in English, and she says to her spirit, says to me, Sid, Francis, help me. Hmm. It was the most desperate cry I've ever heard in my life. And in that moment, the, the fire of God came upon me, and my interpreter said, I put my finger on her, on her head, and I, I said, in the name of Yeshua, unroll. And when I did that, I, had, I saw the golden hand of Jesus go into her body and be pu begin to pull their spirits. They were tied to each other, it was like a long tail, and they began to come out like that. And when, when the last one came out, it's like Jesus threw the whole string of these demons in one string, and the woman fell back with the people who were holding her back, and, by the, and she recovered first, totally healed and Jesus. delivered. Only Jesus, only Jesus, otherwise, 20 years insane, oh, that, was, that was her fate for her whole life. She was eating in the trash cans of the, of the community. She, she was well known. Mm. Now, I know and you know that the devil is terrified at this divine revelation that you received of restraining orders from the courtroom. Uh, before we even get into this. Tell me the circumstances of how you got this revelation. Yes, I was driving from a crusade where I had seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I was listening to Ron Canelli's song, Jesus is Alive, and I was coming towards this, a, a street light. And when I was coming close to it, the Holy Spirit says, I, when you get to the light, I want you, you don't go through it, go to the right and take the longer route to go to your house. Well, when I got to the light, instead of doing what the Holy Ghost had suggested, what I told me to do, I went right through it. I went as far as the next, the next light before I heard a bang and I was spinning because a truck had hit me from behind. 
I was in a borrowed car. It was tortured uh, uh, a seed, and I was terrified. More for, more for the car than for my own life. <laughs> You know, and what I'm standing, uh, the police arrive and they find the guy who hit my car, w did not even have a driver's license, no insurance, so I had to do this, I had to repair this car by myself. And then the Holy Spirit says to me in that moment, when I put an order on you not to go through, you better listen to what I'm saying. That became the seed that would now be, would now God would use to excite this entire revelation on issuing divine restraining orders from the courts of heaven. Now. There have been many that have been teaching on the going to the courtrooms of heaven, but one of the most famous men that has taught on this, he heard your revelation, and what did he say? Oh, uh, Robert Henderson was in my church. And because I had the revelation, I said, I want to test it in front of Robert. I said, Robert, I'm going to test it in front of you because you're one of the fathers of the courtroom uh, revelation. He said, okay, let me listen to it. When he heard me teach on issuing divine restraining orders, he says, oh my God, I've never heard this before, and nobody is ta talking about this side of the judicial government of God. And so he got me in touch with my publishers, Destiny Image, and that's how we got the book out. Now, tell me. Uh, explain to me what a divine restraining order is. A divine uh, restraining order is a restraining or protective order that is issued by the courts of heaven to protect a person of destiny, institution, business, or nation in situations involving clear and present danger to the preordained purposes of God. And once you get this restraining order, who enforces it? You see, this is the power of restraining orders. This is why the devil is terrified of the body of Christ, see, the understanding the revelation of restraining orders. It's because even in the natural realm, uh, one of the most, one of the judicial orders that's more sought after in the United States, by statistics, is restraining orders. Why? Because when a restraining order is issued by a judge, the judge and the court are now responsible for its enforcement. So when heaven, when our heavenly father, who is a righteous judge, therefore gives you a restraining order, the devil is in trouble. Because now the heavenly father, as the righteous judge, he has to enforce the restraining order, not the person it's protecting. So the enforcer is not the police department, but God. God himself. I like that. <laughs> um, Give me a biblical example uh, of a, a restraining order. One of them is your, your people. You see, the Jewish people, they're coming out of, out of the promise, uh, out of Egypt because God has told them to go to right. the promised land. And then they come across the, the Moabites, and there is a King Balak who wants to curse them because he's afraid Israel might take his property, and he goes to a witch by the name of Balaam to try to curse them. And then an angel appears and puts a restraining order on Balaam and tells them, you can never curse Israel, and he couldn't curse them. <laughs> I, I, I think it, it, it says, you can't curse who I have blessed. I like that. Hallelujah. Uh, so it, it, explain this principle of divine restraint. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. When I was writing the book, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Francis, there is, there is, um, there is no way for me to give anybody true godly authority without putting them under a restraining principle. Because the bottom line is this, God can never use a man or woman he cannot restrain. And God said to me, this is why I put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, is because I needed to give Adam and Eve legitimate authority over the animal kingdom, over the fall of the air, over the earth. But authority as a, as, as, as a matter can never exist without a restraining principle. So I put, a, I put one tree, they could ne every tree they could eat from, except one tree. So that tree they could not eat from was the only tree giving them authority over the garden. The more the moment they touched it, they lost authority. Because in, in the kingdom, godly authority ends when the restraining principle protecting it is, bro is broken.
Give me some biblical examples. Well, there's some powerful biblical examples. You know, one of them, one of them is Samson. Samson was told by God that you can have supernatural power over the Philistines provided you do not cut your hair. That was a restraining principle upon his life. Well, he met Delilah and decided, you know what? The girl was more important than the restraining order. So he told her the secret of why he was supernaturally used by God. And you know what she did? She cut his hair overnight and in court for the Philistines. And you know what happened to Samson? He was literally, his eyes were gouged out and he became a public spectacle, spectacle because he broke the restraining principle God had put upon his authority. We find that with King Saul, you know, he was not supposed as, a, as a, in Israel, as coming from the tribe of Benjamin, it was not his place to offer an offering to the Lord. That was for the priests of Levi right. to do that. Yeah. Samson had told, Samuel told him, wait for me, but he couldn't do it. And so he offered as though he was a priest. So by breaking that restraining order, Samson, as Samuel said, you are a fool because now your kingdom has been taken away from you. That's how he lost the kingdom. You know, as people get the richness of your teaching into them and start operating in these divine restraining orders, no wonder it's the devil's worst nightmare. Tell me about the Delilah spirit. The Delilah spirit is a spirit Satan's to incense into your life if you are cutting anything of substance for the kingdom. Because the purpose of the Delilah spirit is to find what is to find the key to your consecration and break it. Because once it's broken, the Delilah spirit knows God cannot use people, he cannot restrain. Give me some you know, of the purposes of divine restraining orders, some of the areas. Yes, some of the areas divine restraining orders cover is you know, restraining is protecting territory. There's also is divine restraining orders for restraining ungodly, violent behavior. And in the days we are living in with mass shootings, boy, do we need that restraining order. And then there's restraining orders for restraining storms and hurricanes, these forces of nature from destroying God's property. And then there are divine restraining orders that restrain God's servants who have got a high calling so that you can't behave like anybody else because you are carrying a heavy weight for the kingdom. And then there are divine restraining orders that are designed to restrain Satan himself. So there are multiple uses of restraining orders. I'll tell you what, Dr. Miles will pray for you in the courts of heaven next when we return. We will be right back to It's Supernatural! Our world is rife with comparisons about what separates us. Day after day, we go about our lives with tunnel vision. But Scripture tells us how Messiah broke down the wall between Jew and Gentile, allowing for the creation of one new man, one new humanity. This spiritual completeness is set to usher in the greatest move toward God the world has ever known. Sid Roth has discovered Scripture's key to reaching the Jewish people with God's love. One New Humanity opens the door for God to move in signs and wonders, and all will see the evidence of the invisible God promised in Scripture. At SidRoth.org, you'll find mentoring tools to empower you to share how One New Humanity is critical to bringing multitudes to know God. You'll understand Israel and the Jewish roots of the church, and how all the nations of the earth will experience blessings unseen in human history. Log on to SidRoth.org today and learn how one new man is the key to unlocking God's greatest blessings. For he himself is our peace, who has made both Jew and Gentile into one, and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. His purpose was to create in himself. To create in himself. His purpose was to create one new man. One new man. One new man. Adin novi chalavyak. The Adam Hadash Echad. One new man. We now return to It's Supernatural. You know, I, I, I've got two parts of me. One part is uh, interest in the visible world. The other part is, God's blessed me, I have a very logical brain. So I want to, uh, from a logical viewpoint, what's the first thing we have to do to get a divine restraining order? The first thing we have to do, Sid, to get a divine restraining order from the righteous judge is to repent. 
absolutely to repent. I don't even hear that word anymore. <laughs> well, listen, there are people now who are teaching, uh, uh, who are saying that under grace we don't have to, re to repent. I think that really that's really a demonic strategy to rob our authority from coming before the court of heaven. Because, you know, see, the word repentance simply means to be in right standing. It literally means to t t turn back, you know, and come into alignment with the governing authority. How can we come before God asking him to restrain the devil when we are not restrained? That's, right. That's a legal right the devil has to argue. argue. The devil can argue against us in the court of heaven and say, Lord, why would they restrain me? You know, why would you, they come here to restrain me when they want to listen to you? So repentance allows us to come before God and say, God, as I come to ask for something I really need for you to do for me, Lord, I realize that there are areas where I have broken your word, where I have not walked like you. And thank God the blood of Jesus was shed for just things like that. You want to be in a right place when you're asking. There is nothing in the court where the enemy can contest what you're trying to request from the court. Tell me about the woman in your church that needed a divine restraining order. Oh, I, I mean, I have a, <laughs> you know, my church is very multiracial. So I had a, this is one of my Caucasian uh, members. She came to my office on a Sunday morning See, The worship was going, I could hear in the background, but she wanted to see me. Mm -hmm. I, her eyes were bloodshot, and I realized, I said, oh, what, what, what happened to you? She, she said, I've been crying all night. She, uh, she said to me, I can't live like this. And then just tears began to come down. And then she said, well, I used to be, I used to have a good marriage until one day I found my husband was cheating in our, in our, in our matrimonial bed uh, with a woman half of his age, devastated me. He ran out with this woman. He says, but I was getting healed from it, but the problem is we've got two children together. And he says, Dr. Miles, every time he comes to pick the children so he can spend time with them, he comes with the woman that broke my marriage. It's like, it's like flaunting it in my face. And then he sometimes is very verbally abusive to me in front of the girl mm. that destroyed my marriage. And she cries, I'm a child of God. I can't be treated can't like this. I'm no trash. God help me. The, I could see was, what the point of breaking down. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit said to her, ask her for, say, tell her to ask her that she wanted a divine, that she wanted a restraining order. So I said to her, I says, as a sister, do you, God, do you want a restraining order? She thought I'm talking about going to natural courts. Right. <laughs> she reacts, she says, no, I would like to get one, but I don't have the money to take longer to go through. I don't have an attorney. I said, I'm not talking about natural restraining orders. He says, as you are talking to me, your heavenly father has heard your cry and is asking me, do you want me to bring you before him to get the divine restraining order against this man's behavior? She said, you mean God issues restraining orders? I said, of course, he's the righteous judge. He's the first judge. She said, let's do it. So I said, what do you want? She said, I want him to stop insulting me. Uh, and she said, I want him to stop coming to collect the children with this woman who broke our marriage. And thirdly, the kids have been begging to go and see my grandparents who live in another, another state. Every time I beg him to take them, to take my children there, he's promised me he'll go to the Phoenix Police Department and, and uh, file kidnapping charges. So the kids can't even go and see their grandparents. Mm. I need those three things. So we went before the court of heaven and we asked for a restraining order against this man in those areas. See, it's less than 48 hours. The man calls her and is crying on the phone. He says, I, he says to her, I do not know why I've treated you so miserably. You don't deserve it. You didn't break the covenant, I did. I did. He said, listen, I wanna make amends. I wanna make amends. And he said, here is what I'm gonna do. And he begins to spew out what was in the divine restraining order. He said to her, number one, he says to her, <laughs> he says to her, he says, I promise you, Whenever I come to take the children now, I will not bring this woman with me. She'll remain behind. I've already told her, you don't deserve to relieve the affair. Yeah. Number two, I am so sorry for the verbally abusive I've been towards you. I am sorry. I'll never do it again. He says, number three, you've been trying to take the children out of state. You have my permission to take them out of state. <laughs> Less than 48 hours. In your book, you talk about a man uh, from Germany leaves his wife, his daughter goes to another country. Uh, tell me about that restraining order. Yes, uh, uh, th there's, there's a woman who hears about me 
teaching. I was doing an online Bible study on issuing divine restraining orders from the courts of heaven. And she happened to logging into the court from Germany. As soon as she heard me teach on restraining orders, she began, she, she, she began, she began to cry. She realized this was the missing link. She had tried everything, Sid. Her husband had left overnight without even telling her. She came home to a note that told her, I'm done with the marriage. And, uh, and he left her and the daughter and went to another European country. And then a couple of months later, the, uh, the proceeding for divorce began to happen within the German court system. So for a year, she has not heard from me. She doesn't even know where he is. But when she, then she went before, she to the mass, I felt led by the Holy Spirit to go before the court by myself, using the little I heard about who you told me, and I asked my Heavenly Father, the righteous judge, for a restraining order against a spirit that is behind my husband not wanting to be the king and the prophet and the priest of our family. She said, I, the, within 24 hours, he calls me and he said he has not called me in almost 12 months. He calls me and he's crying on the other side of the phone. He said... She said to her wife, I'm so sorry, I abandoned you. If you, if it's okay with you, if you can still have me, I want to come back for you because I really want to become the husband I should have been. I am so sorry. He said, please come. Right now, he's in Germany, and they're, it's like they're having a honeymoon again. It's, it, the man is, the, is everything a husband should be. <laughs> you are <laughs> one of the so helpful things in your book beyond someone has to read it to get this revelation deep within them mm. the teaching because the teaching it's, is revelation that's itself. right help but then you have 18 prayers for 18 different things that people may need restraining orders for tell me some of those prayers what do they cover oh my god we've got at a prayer against uh, for releasing divine restraining orders against premature death and uh, then we've got a prayer against uh, restraining witchcraft we've got a prayer that uh, for restraining the spirit of terrorism we've got uh, prayers for for uh, for restraining uh, covenant marriage breakers I mean this thing is loaded and what we have done is I wanted to make sure seed that people's journey to the court of heaven is successful that was important to me because I know God does not bend at the whim of human emotion. God is God, and God always wants what he wants. You can't manipulate God by emotion, but you can move him by the word. So we made sure that the prayers were, for lack of a better word, foolproof. That they are written in such a way that when you go to the court of heaven, it won't be a journey in vain. When you come back, the restraining order will be issued. And that's why people are getting these answers to prayer just like that. I want to pray that your start would be to have every one of your sins washed away. I want you to say this prayer. I want this to be a new beginning for you. But I want you to have your own encounter with God. I want you to open the door with your own mouth. Repeat this prayer and mean it to the best of your knowledge. Repeat this after me. Dear God, Dear God I've committed many sins, committed many sins and, I'm so and I'm so sorry. I believe, I believe the, blood of Jesus the blood of Jesus washes them away. Washes them away. And, God, and God, you have no memory of them anymore. No anymore. And, I'm clean. and I'm clean. And now that I'm clean, and now that I'm clean Make my, body Make my body the temple, the temple of, your of your Holy Spirit. Jesus, come inside of me. I call you Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's not enough time for Pastor Francis to pray for you in the courts of heaven. So to see the last part of this show, go to sidroth.org slash miles right now. 
prayer is an essential part to access every one of God's promises and blessings for your life. And praying daily in your God-given prayer language is so important in light of the times we are living. Introducing the brand new Sid Roth God Talk app. With this new prayer app, you will be able to set a reminder for when you want to pray. Let others know the time you spent in prayer each day for accountability. Take advantage of our worldwide prayer app community to lift your prayer requests to God. It includes a video teaching on how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how to effectively pray the supernatural language that God has given you on a daily basis. Watch our TV archives and ISN, our It's Supernatural Network, to build your faith to believe God for the impossible. The app is free and available available for iPhone, iPad, or Android devices. Just go to your device's app store and search for Sid Roth's God Talk. A botched surgery leaves a Jewish man paralyzed for life. He becomes deeply depressed, knowing that he'll be confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his days. But then he discovers a revelation that totally changes his life and leads him to be miraculously healed. He completely regains the ability to walk even though 25 doctors, neurosurgeons, and neurologists can't explain this. Do you want to learn what this revelation was? For the ending to this true story, go to www.theythoughtforthemselves.com. Next week on It's Supernatural. Hi, I'm Anna Werner. Recently, God took me through a season teaching me insights and keys to combat in the supernatural realm. He wants a strong warrior bride who also knows how to dance. So join me on the next It's Supernatural with Sid Roth and get ready to learn the heavenly strategy to freedom and victory. Your gifts to this ministry will help Sid air It's Supernatural in Israel 28 times a week and distribute his evangelistic book to the Jewish people worldwide. 